having a great time tonight. And this morning, the presence of the Lord filled the house. I think about five received the Holy Ghost, two baptized, one received the Holy Ghost prior to that in one of the previous services, and three baptized. So I think we've had about six get the Holy Ghost and five baptized in Jesus' name. And I think that's conservative because I believe there are folks that, that were getting filled with the power of God that we didn't even get a chance to see who they were. Praise God. So we're thankful for what God is doing in our midst. He is great and greatly to be praised. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise God. That was beautiful. Praise team did a great job. And I appreciate the good presence of the Lord. Not only was it good, it was anointed. And that's the difference between apostolic and some others. Hallelujah. So I'm thankful for that. Praise God. It's been a real pleasure to be with you this uh, last few nights. We'll be in the key of G. The only one I brought. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with all of you. I, I know I'm among friends. I know my family's anxiously waiting for me to get back home, so that's something I'm looking forward to as well. But we've had such a wonderful time being with all of you and appreciate you so much. Pastor Brown and his beautiful wife. a guy that looks like you. <laughs> it's truly a pleasure to be with you and, and uh, Bishop Crawford and his wife. What a wonderful family they are. The whole Crawford family is just a wonderful family and known them for many years. Was that Brother Crawford that said Amen. Oh, it was you. Okay, I was just checking. <laughs> We've known Brother Crawford's been my friend for many years, and uh, I am always trying to seek the Lord right before a service to, to be sure that I'm in tune with the Holy Ghost. So he patiently waits while I pray. Hallelujah. And then I had Sister Crawford waiting on me tonight, too. God bless her. Praise God. Well, do you think we might be able to get the train to go one more time? bound for glory this train this train is bound for glory this train this train is bound for glory and if you're going to get to heaven you've got to live holy this train is bound for glory this train has one station this train this train only has one station this train this train only has one station Acts 238 salvation this train only has one station this train
Praise God. Praise God. Let's lift our voices now. Let's praise the Lord. God, you're so good to us. We give you praise. We give you glory and honor tonight, Lord. We bless your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I believe there's some more tonight that God wants to fill with the Holy Ghost. And if you're here tonight and you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, well, this is your night. I don't care if you've been seeking for a long time, this is your night. If you've never asked God before, this is your night. If you're a saint of God and you're expected to go in the rapture, this is your night to be renewed. Don't try making this rapture trip on a half tank of fuel. I do not recommend it. <laughs> but be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God, right? Praise God. So if you have your Bibles, let's preach for a few minutes. Let's let God do some healings here in a little bit. And let's let the Lord fill people with the Holy Ghost. You see, this God that I serve is the living God. Hallelujah. He's alive and well. Thank you again for all your hospitality. And we have enjoyed ourselves so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise God. Glad to hear the report, uh, what happened in Toronto today. Praise God. And what happened here, there's a great move of God going on all across our world. Recently, my son Shane was in a crusade where 12,000 people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. So we know that God is moving and that the time is running out. One of the signs of the times is the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Ladies and gentlemen, that has already started happening. Lift up your eyes, your redemption draweth nigh. And now I go to the book of Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Luke chapter 15, verse 11, I won't preach long. You may think it's long if you're the one receiving on the receiving end of it, but it won't be very long. <laughs> I hope you'll receive what God has for you tonight. Luke 15, 11, and he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Father, I ask you tonight that you would bless us and help us that you would touch the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. I pray, God, that your will would be done complete and totally tonight, and that souls who are not ready would be made ready for the coming of the Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you missed it this morning, you may be seated. I was preaching on the road to Armageddon, and I feel very strongly that we are racing now the end time, and that the coming of the Lord is very, very near. Tonight, I'm preaching from the story of the prodigal son. A man had two sons. He loved those kids so very much. He would say things like, I, I love you to the moon and back. I love you forever. Dad loved those kids so much that his whole world revolved around them. And you can believe that dad was very proud of his boys. I believe that his face would light up when the boys came into his room, home from school. Sometimes he would buy them something just as a surprise. 
And it brought him so much joy to see their excited faces when they found out what he had done for them. When a person decides to leave a family, it is not usually a sudden decision. Usually there's been some thoughts, there's been some actions, there's been a period of time. And, and at first, the person who is leaving his home hides his intentions as he lays his plans of leaving. He plans to leave family traditions. He plans to separate himself and ever so gradually from the ones who love him the most. I've watched this happen over the years in different families. I've even seen it happen in my own family. And what a heartbreak it is when you see somebody beginning to distance themselves from, from their family. And they begin to do it slowly, ever so slowly, but nevertheless, they're doing it. I, I just want to say to you tonight that Satan operates knowing, we ought to know that he operates as a roaring lion. If you've had any video clips of lions over in some of the places in Africa, you'll notice that lions hunt in packs or in prides. And they usually, no, not usually, they almost invariably will try to separate the animal from the rest of the flock that they intend to, to, to destroy. I think it's important for you to understand that when Satan decides to destroy a man, a woman, or a boy, or a girl, one of the first things he has to do is he has to try to make you feel distant from the flock. He's not doing it because of any reason that you know about. He's doing it with one deadly intention. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He is the originator of the Hamas ideology. He's vicious and mean. And so I want you to understand Ladies and gentlemen, where we are in the midst of a spiritual battle. Now, I've been pastoring for many years, and I can tell you that I speak from the heart of a pastor. And I can tell you that just as in a physical family, in the spiritual family, it works the very same way. And Satan will try to find some way to divide you from your brother, to divide you from your sister. He's not doing it because he loves you. He's not doing it to help you. He's doing it because he intends to destroy you. And the only way he can do that <laughs> is to try to separate you from the flock. Do not allow it to happen. I need to hear a resounding amen. <clears throat> amen. This may not be a real exciting message for you. And I may not be jumping up and down, but what I am telling you will make the difference between heaven or hell. It will make the difference between success or failure. It will make the difference between a long life and a life that is cut short. Hear the word of the Lord. Wow. I just felt the Holy Ghost. Dads can be naive. And I think in our story, this dad never saw it coming until it hit him like a freight train. And that was the day when the younger son walked into the house and said, I want my share of your estate now. I don't want to wait for you to die. It was disrespectful. It was disheartening when this young man said, I want my share of your estate right now. First of all, sir, the world doesn't owe you anything. Nobody owes you anything. You owe the world a lot, but the world doesn't owe you anything. You owe dad something, but dad doesn't owe you anything. Our spiritual father already gave his life at a place called Calvary and shed his blood. He's already paid the price. So that day, 
when the younger son said, I want my share of your estate. That one single statement struck dad like a bullet to the heart. It was all dad could do to stay standing. You ever been in a situation like that? It was like someone had just taken their fist and hit him in the solar plexus. He was a grown man. But I guarantee you it was all dad could do not to ball right there in front of his son, in front of God, in front of everybody. And in spite of dad's objections, the boy stubbornly shook his head, refused to listen to his dad's counsel. After having pastored for 47 years and been a minister of the United Pentecostal Church for 51 years, I can tell you that success and failure are determined basically by two things. These two things will determine your success or your failure. Number one, no matter what, you must stay connected with the flock that God has placed you in. Trust me when I tell you, I watched it over and over again. And number two, get good advice and you will succeed. Don't go charging down the road of life without good counsel. I was driving up the road that our church is on and, and as I came to the church parking lot, I noticed that one of our young ministers was having a yard sale. He hadn't asked me, but... He was having a yard sale in the church parking lot. Not only was he having a yard sale in the church parking lot without asking, the funds that he was getting from the yard sale, he was going to use for his moving expense, which he had not talked with me about that either. And finally, when he got done selling his stuff, he, he said something about a, just letting you know I'm leaving and, and he was gone. Today that man has been backslidden for several years now. He went to another city. He tried to do a work for God. Didn't seem to ever get his feet under him. And slowly he gave up this apostolic truth. Until today you would never know that one time he had been an apostolic preacher, that his mother was an apostolic woman, that his grandmother was an apostolic woman. You would never know that, but somewhere along the way, he decided he was going to make some choices, and he never sought out good counsel. The Bible says that every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice, make war. Proverbs 24 and 6 says, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in multitude of counselors there is safety. I'm remembering a king in the Old Testament. His name was Amaziah. He was the ninth king, number nine, of Judah. He started out well. But along the journey, he made a wrong turn, and he got out of the will of God. So God sent a prophet to counsel him and to turn him back in the right direction. But what did King Amaziah do? He resented and refused the counsel. And I read to you just a little excerpt from his story in 2 Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 14. Now it came to pass that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites they brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods and bowed down himself before them and burned incense unto them. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah and he sent unto him a prophet which said unto him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? And it came to pass as he talked with him, as the prophet talked with him, that the king said unto him, Art thou made of the king's counsel? Forbear, why shouldest thou be smitten? Translation. Since when have I asked you for advice? Be quiet now, 
before I have you killed. Then the prophet forbear and said, I know that God hath determined to destroy thee because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. Two times in the word of God, the holy book, it says, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. And when this king, who was a child of David, said something like, since when have I asked your advice? Be quiet now before I have you killed. He made a big error. Satan knows that the word of God, when it states something, is always true. And did you know that three times, not once, not twice, but three times, the Bible said, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. So Satan will look for ways to distance you from the person who God has called to be your shepherd. Can I get an amen? Good counsel, however, only works when followed. Don't bother me asking for counsel if after I have spoken with you, you go out and do the very opposite of that which I counseled you to do. It's a waste of your time and it's a waste of my time and it only makes you more guilty before God. When God sends a man of God into your life and he says, thus and thus uh, you need to do, I think it would be very wise for you to say, yes, Lord, here I am. I want to do your will. Let me tell you something. You're not going to get the voice of God off the Internet. You're not going to get the voice of God from a TV preacher that's living behind a high wall with a big mansion. You're going to get the word of God every time you come to your church and the preacher, the pastor gets up and he preaches the word of God. I can't tell you how many times my life has been spared by the preaching of the word. How many times that God has spared me. And the reason that I am in the church now and that I've been a licensed minister for 51 years is not because I never made mistakes. It's not because I was perfect. It was because when God spoke to me through the man of God or through the woman of God, whichever the case was, I was quick to bow my knee and say, yes, Lord, not mine, but thine, not my will, but thine be done. I'll never forget many years ago, I was just starting to preach, and, and I began preaching actually at 16. I went to the Illinois District Board at age 16 and applied for a local license. They said, you're too young, son, go home. I was crushed. I went home. I waited for the next board meeting. A year later, I turned 17. I went back to the board. They looked at each other, kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, he's not going to leave us alone. We might as well give him a license. <laughs> so one day, as a young teenage preacher, my uncle came over to visit. Now, he was a good man. He came in, and after we sat down for a bit, he began to talk. And what he was talking about was how badly his pastor had treated him. And I sat there. I was just a teenager. And I listened, and I began to resent that man of God. I never said a word. But inside I was seething, how dare this, this pastor treat my uncle the way my uncle said he had been treated. And I was, I was pretty ticked. I never added a comment, I just listened. And as God would have it, just a few days or weeks later, my telephone rang. And the church that my uncle had attended ask if I would come over and speak. I said, yes, I'd be glad to come over and speak. I was glad for any opportunity. I was also scared to death. So it was mixed emotions. So I went to 
church that night in a town I won't tell you where. <laughs> and I walked in and went up to the platform and sat down, and here's this old gray-haired man of God sitting next to me. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, the preacher strode to the pulpit. There was nobody standing in the pulpit, but the preacher was in the pulpit of my heart. And he began to say, what do you think you were doing? Listen to what your uncle had to say. And now you're going to stand in this man's pulpit, and you're going to preach. And I said, but I didn't say anything. But you listened. Yes, I did. So when I got done preaching, I walked over and I stood in front of this very well-known pastor. And I said, brother, I have to apologize to you. I didn't say anything about you, but I listened. When I walked out the door of that church that night, Rick Stoops could walk out the door without opening it because I felt small enough that I could walk to the crack in the bottom of the door. I was never invited to come back and preach there again. But I learned a valuable lesson. It was a lesson that God wanted me to learn. And because I learned that lesson, I am still in the house of God all these many years later. Understand that when the devil is looking for a way to destroy you, he's going to try to distance you from the person who God has called, not you, God has called to be your shepherd. Good counsel only works if followed. And the apostle Paul gave good advice. He said, sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only to the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenix and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat. I am preaching to somebody in the Holy Ghost that is about to go through a storm. I can spare you that storm. Listen to my counsel. Which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand straight sail and so were driven and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. Bow your heads with me. I'm not done preaching, so don't get to thinking that. But bow your heads with me. Father, you have sent out a word right now. I felt the Holy Ghost just sweep through this house. I pray that every heart would recognize the voice of the Master. And that they would say, yes, Lord, I hear you speaking, Lord. That they would be spared from the storm. That that individual would be spared from the storm. Where everything in their life is going to be picking up. 
And everything in their life is going to have to be tossed because of the storm. But tonight I pray, God, help us that they would hearken unto me and not loose and not go the way that they are intended to go and gain this harm and loss. If my mother was here right now, she would be giving a message in tongues. And I would interpret it. Folks, ladies and gentlemen, this is not just a, a preacher getting up to preach a sermon. I have toiled and sat in my room and was late for church tonight because I felt after the Lord to seek direction from God. And I'm praying tonight that everyone will hear the sound of my voice and say yes to you. Yes to you, Jesus. I, the Lord thy God, would spare you much trouble. I would spare you much harm. I have sent my servant to speak to you. Listen to the counsel that you are receiving now. Allow yourself to be guided. Be not as a horse who has to have a bit put in his mouth to pull him around. But I ask that you would listen and willingly say, yes, Lord. Not my will, thine be done. Could we just lift our voices right now and let's give God a praise. Could we give God a praise right now? Come on, somebody. Come on, we can give God. Let's give God a big praise. Something just happened. Can somebody tell me what just happened? The Holy Ghost is walking through this place. In the name of Jesus, here I am, God, to do thy will. I actually feel like when I stand in the pulpit like this that I am battling for somebody. I am not battling against you, but I am battling for you. I love you, and, and the Holy Ghost is here, and, and God loves you even more. And oh, how God would love to lead you like a shepherd leads his sheep. Oh, how God would love to guide you like a shepherd guides his sheep. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers its chicks under its wings, but you would not. Whew. Okay, I'll go back to the prodigal. There was a hardness that had taken over this once kind and tender-hearted and loving son. Tyson, I'm so glad to see you back in the house of God. Don't you ever turn around. Because I will tell you, sir, that God saved you from something that was too horrible for your parents even to know. And the call of God is upon you, young man. Lift your hands right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, let the calling of God be fulfilled in this man's life. Satan, you fought hard and long to take him out. But God has loved him and brought him back into the house of God. And all the parents that are here who have prodigal sons or daughters, stand to your feet and begin to praise God. For the God who brought Tyson in is also going to bring your children in. Come on, let's give God the praise. Hallelujah! I give glory to God. I give glory to God. I give glory to God.
Don't worry, Mom. They're coming home. Don't worry, Dad. They're coming home. It's going to be all right. God's going to bring them in. Hallelujah. Come on, let's begin to shout. Let's begin to praise God. Let's thank God like we will when that child walks in the door and throws his hat on the chair and says, your prodigal is home. When I speak tonight, I speak by the authority of the name of Jesus. I'm not speaking it just in a random fashion. It's not in my notes, but the Holy Ghost is saying, I will surely bring back the prodigal sons and the prodigal daughters. Only I would say to you, be ready to receive them. Be ready to accept them. Be ready to say, welcome home. They've already been beat up. They already know they've made a big mistake. They've already paid for their sins. They don't need your critique. They don't need your criticism. They need your love. Can somebody lift your voice and shout unto God with a voice of triumph? Hallelujah! My God, the Holy Ghost is in this place. Hold up a hand and and use however many children you have, put that amount of fingers in the air. They're outside the ark of safety. And say with me right now, prophetically, come home. In the name of Jesus Christ, come home. North, give up. South, hold not back. East and west, yield. For the Lord is bringing the prodigal sons home and the prodigal daughter. Oh, my God. I'm going to give God a praise right now. You do whatever you want to do, but I'm going to praise God for a moment. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to speak to a mother right now. I'm going to speak to a mother who has literally been sick with fear. You've been so fearful that your children will not come home. But I command that spirit of fear to leave you now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and I replace it with the spirit of faith and anticipation of what God is going to do. I want some mother that's been battling with fear to step out into the aisle and do just a little victory dance right now. Right now. Right now. Not tomorrow. Not in five minutes. I want you to do a victory dance right now. Right now. This is for your daughter. This is for your son. This is for your prodigal. Right now. Right now. Right now. Listen very carefully. If this be a word from the Lord, somebody will receive a healing right now. If what I have just said is the truth, and God indeed is going to bring your prodigal sons and daughters home, somebody who came here with a disease or a sickness or whatever is going to be healed right where you sit or stand, lift your hand, and begin to praise God. 
You'll feel a warmth going down your hand. You'll feel a warmth going down your arm. You'll feel a warmth coming over your head. You'll feel the healing power of the Lord. I say in the name of Jesus Christ, woman, I loose you from the spirit of infirmity. In the name of Jesus, sir, I loose you from the spirit of infirmity. Somebody can testify right now that God has healed their body in the name of Jesus. Sugar diabetes, I command you to leave this room now in the mighty name of Jesus. Cancer, I command you to leave this room now in the mighty name of Jesus. Heart disease, I command you to leave this room now. You are dismissed. I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. Nervous system, be healed right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Back pain, be gone now, instantly, right now in the name of Jesus. Brain tumor be removed right now in the mighty name of Jesus. For our God is an awesome God. And he reigns in the affairs of men. Somebody just felt the healing come to your body. Where are you? Somebody just felt the healing come to your body. Where are you? Wave your hand right now. If you felt the healing come to your body, wave your hand. Come on, wave your hand. The spirit, of, there you go. All right, I see that one. Wave your hand. If you felt the presence of God coming and healing your body, praise God. That's it. Wave your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, everybody. Let's give God a great big praise. Just a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, the medicine go down, the medicine go... Sit down. God puts a spoonful of sugar in with the medicine. Protect your heart. For out of it are the issues of life. Keep your heart tender. Love like you've never loved before. And do not keep score. Just a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. See, God just got through healing some folks. And making you a promise that he's going to bring your prodigal sons and daughters in. And then he turns around and says, okay, don't let a hardness come to your heart. And this prodigal son had allowed a hardness that had taken over his once kind and tenderhearted and loving spirit. I'm going to read to you from the Holy Writ. Hebrews 12, 15 looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Look after each other, so that not one of you will fail to find God's best blessings. Watch out that no bitterness takes root among you, for as it springs up, it causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. When the prodigal talked to his dad, his face was hard. He showed no emotion. He had made up his mind, and that was all there was to it. See, he had already talked with 
a few of his so-called friends, and they had encouraged him to go through with it. Some people's advice really stinks. That's why God places a man of God. You may have heard about the saint was on her way home from church and she looked up and there was somebody that attended the church off and on with one foot upon the rail of the bridge. So she ran up and they talked for several minutes and then they both jumped. Some advice is not good. His friend said, oh, brother, God, you're going to say something that somebody has verbatim said. I know it right now. His friend said, you have to do what you want to do. His friend said, church is not for everybody. And his friend said, you will really like your freedom. I'm just going to look down. I promise you his father tried to get his son to reason. He tried so hard to rationalize with his boy. But the more he reasoned, the more angry his boy got, and the more dis disrespectful he became. So finally the father's shoulders slumped, and he said, okay, okay. I really love you so much that I will, I will divide my wealth between you and your brother. And a few days later, this younger son packed up all this stuff, determined that no one would sway him. He followed through with his plan. He took a trip to a distant land. Oh, it wasn't geographically so far, but distant from everything he had ever been taught. And he pushed from his mind all the nighttime stories and prayers and all the chuckles and belly laughs and and all the good times he had had. He, no, he pushed it out of his head, and he walked. Where hustle's the name of the game. And nice guys get washed away like the snow and the rain. There's been a load of compromising on the road to my horizon, but I'm going to be where the lights are shining on me like a rhinestone cowboy. Riding out on a horse, in a star-spangled rodeo like a rhinestone cowboy, cowboy getting cards and letters from people I don't even know and offers coming over the phone. But it never works that way. And I'm going to cut to the quick. Just so happened the day he ran out of money, there was a, a famine that swept across the land. Imagine that. It seemed as like there was a demonic chuckle coming from somewhere. It was not just by chance that the day he ran out of money, a famine hit and hit hard. But he said, hey, I've been lining up the drinks for my friends, and I got some friends. So he goes to them and says, hey, I need a little loan. They said, get lost. Man, really, I need some help. Get out of here. No one would know him. Nobody cared for his soul. So he goes to a wealthy farmer. He says, hey, uh, I'll work. I, I, I need to eat. I'm hungry. He said, uh, where are you from, son? He said, uh, I'm a Jew. You're a Jew, huh? Yep. He said, well, I got just a job for you. I'm going to send you out in the pigsty. Wait, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. My mom and dad taught me I'm not to do that. Son, you want to eat? You get out there in the pigsty. And now he's walking in the muck and the mire of the pigs. And he starts thinking about home. And he starts thinking about all the things. And I believe that God is talking to some of our prodigals tonight. I know there were times when he thought, dear dad, how are things back home? But you thought I'd never care. There was a time when I felt lucky just to be away from there. But I've had all of what I thought I wanted, and now what I want 
I just can't find. And how things are at home has been lately on my mind. Dad, I'm all alone in New York City searching for that pot of gold, but Dad, I'm at the end of all my rainbows and all at once I'm feeling old, Daddy. I'm kind of tired of how I'm living, of what I am and what I'm not. And Daddy, the only gold I've found in New York City was in the bottom of a Salvation Army pot. And I hear God calling to somebody tonight, both inside and outside the building. I hear God calling, come home. Lay it down. Lay it down. But God, you don't know what happened. Do you really think that's true? God doesn't know what happened? Are you really going to say that? Of course God knows what happened. Lay it down. Well, what do you want me to do? Go to the altar. Well, God, it ain't fair. It's fair. It's fair enough. I gave my life for you. It wasn't fair when they spat on me. It wasn't fair when they ripped my back with a whip. It wasn't fair when they laughed and called me vulgar names and gambled for my garments while I hung naked on a cross. And I'm calling you to come home. Of course, recently I lost my mother. I didn't lose her. She went to heaven. But she taught me these things that I'm teaching you tonight. She went through many, 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 many more years than I did of living for God. She started living in 1938. Do you know how many times she had the opportunity to be offended? Do you know how many times she had the opportunity to walk away and say, that's it? But Mama just hung on. Not only did she hang on, my dad wasn't going to church in those days, and mom would say, Ricky, get in the car. I said, Mama, I think I'll stay home with dad tonight. No, you're not. You get in the car right now. My mom was about five foot two, 115, 120 pounds. When I saw the look in her eye, I got in the car. I was not raised in a democracy. I didn't get to vote. It was a dictatorship. A benevolent dictatorship. And because every time troubles came, mom would fall to her knees and she would take it to God in prayer. And she kept her spirit right. She kept her attitude right. She kept going to church. She kept following the, the Lord. She kept listening to the man of God. Back in the old days, folks were not quite as, uh, I don't want to say the word liberal, but uh, you didn't get away with as much as a child. If I got a SWAT at school, I didn't tell mom. Because when I got home, I was going to get another one. And it didn't matter whose fault it was. I remember my, my pastor grabbing me by the arm as a little kid as I was rocketing by him. Whoa! You want me to spank you? Well, some of you would quit church if your pastor said that. Not my mom. I didn't even tell mom pastor said that to me because when I got home, even though he didn't do it, she was gonna. And I learned the value of the house of God. I learned the value of the people of God, the man of God, my walk with God. And because that woman instilled those values into me, I preached on the steps of the Museum for Atheism in Leningrad in the USSR. 
because she put those values into me. I preached a crusade in the Caribbean islands and another one in England and another one in France because what she told me was something that kept my feet in the straight and narrow way and I made sure I'm not going to end up on the outside looking in. I'm always going to be living for God. Bow your heads with me. Another sweep of God's presence is going to come through here, and I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. I am preaching to somebody who desperately needs to heed my counsel. If you would like to be around a year from tonight, you need to heed my counsel. I feel the presence of God in this house. My God. I want to be careful what I say because I don't want anything to happen that would not be for your good. I want everybody to make heaven their home. I want everybody to be saved. I want the city of Peterborough to be saved with the only gospel that saves, Acts 2.38. I want to see people loving and nurturing and believing and praying, and I believe I'm seeing that, but I'm also going to call to you, and I'm going to say, come home. It's supper time. Back in the old days, Sister Crawford, I want you to come back to the keyboard. I'm sorry to keep working you so hard. But we used to sing some of the old songs, and, and I like the new ones that were sung tonight, wonderful, wonderful songs. But I also think we need to keep one hand reaching back and holding on to our Pentecostal heritage. Sister Crawford, you remember that song they used to sing, Come Home, Come Home, It's Supper Time. I think we need to wait on the Lord for a moment while she plays that song for us. And if she knows the words, she can sing it. If not, just play it. But I feel the presence of God calling to us. Would you like to be a part of the greatest revival that Ontario has ever seen? I rejoice with 35 and, and six people here that received the Holy Ghost. That's 41 that I know of in the province of Ontario in the last few nights, including today. But there's a greater revival coming than we could ever think. And somebody, somebody is going to be saved because you listened to this message. Somebody that you're going to reach Satan cannot stop you now. Come home. Come home. It's supper time. The shadows lengthen fast. Come home, come home, it's supper time. We're going home at last. The old song goes something like this, it says, some of my fondest memories of my childhood were woven around supper time when my mother used to call from the back steps of the old home place. Come on home now, son. It's supper time. Oh, but I'd love to hear that voice one more time. But you know, for me, time has woven the realization of the truth that even more thrilling. And that's when the call comes from the portals of glory to come home. For it's supper time. And all God's children shall gather around the table of the Lord himself. 
at the greatest supper time of them all. Close your eyes, lift your hands. Do you feel it? Come home, come home. It's supper time. The shadows lengthen fast. Come home. Come home. It's supper time. We're going. At last. And I wonder while everyone's sitting there with your eyes closed just for a moment. I felt like God was going to be speaking to some folks tonight. I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to head for the airport after church tonight. And I do not know if I will ever get to see you again. And I'm wondering, is there anybody here tonight that, first of all, if you're here and you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, if you'd come forward tonight and ask God, He'll fill you tonight with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. He loves you. It's the devil that wants to harm you, not the Lord. The Lord will never harm you. If you'd like to come, I know it's a little uncomfortable for you the Lord's already showed me who you are if you just get up and walk down to the front God will fill you with his spirit and he will do a great work in your life and he's calling to you come home come home God makes a call, it's really important that you answer and say, yes, Lord, here am I. I'll make it easier for you. Would everybody please stand? I'm going to make it easier for that person. And if everybody would just keep their eyes closed, that person would feel a little bit more comfortable. And maybe you might even ask one of your friends to go with you. Or maybe your friend should ask you to go with them. But I know that God is calling. God bless these people. You have to be courageous, folks. You can't, you can't let the moment pass by and, and then later say, oh, I wish, I so wish I had answered that call. And while you're thinking about it, I want to also call to someone who needs to be renewed in the Holy Spirit of God. You need to let the love of God flood your soul and turn the page on the past. Satan doesn't want to help you. If you only could understand, his only desire is to steal, kill, and destroy. But you can defeat him by listening to the call of God tonight. A pastor, or excuse me, I'm not a pastor. Evangelist. I'm so used to being a pastor. I don't want everybody thinking I'm a big time sinner. That's the problem. You got way too much pride. Who cares what other people think? If I were you, I'd be more concerned about what Jesus thinks. And if this this may be the night that he calls your name. I would feel a lot better about it if you'd walk down to the front and say, oh God, I feel in my spirit you're talking to me, so I say yes to you. Several that have come down, some have brought their children. I know some folks have already gotten the healing. I'm really just waiting right now for two people that I've seen two, I, I, I see at least two, and 
you're sitting in different parts of the building, but there's two people that God is calling urgently and saying, hey, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Wouldn't you be willing to lay it on the altar and say, God, for my soul's sake and for the sake of the souls that you will use me to save, I lay it on the altar. I'm never going to pick it up again. I lay it on the altar. The individual right now, you've been thinking about it all during the last few moments and, well, it's... There's a lady here and there's a gentleman and I'm just waiting because God loves you so much. So I'll just wait another moment and I'll just pray and while I'm praying, why don't you get out of your seat and make your way down to the front and, and just stand there and talk to God for a moment and just say, Lord, here I am. I give my heart, my life, my all to you I'm not going to hold anything back from you sir I lay it all down for you I trust you I give you my all Father here I am oh how the devil hates it when people obey the voice of God oh how he despises it when people obey the voice of God. In Jesus' name! Oh, how the devil hates it when a person says, Lord, I give my life to you. You may think I'm young and I have nothing to fear and certainly I don't want you to be in fear, but I want you to know that God's calling you. And so, I'm going to lift my hands and anybody that wants to join me, let's lift our hands to God right now. Let's begin to praise the Lord. Let's lift up the name of Jesus right now. And let's just say, Lord, I'm coming home. Lord, let your will be done in my life. I desire your will to be done in my life. Maybe you ought to reach out to a friend right now and, and just say, Lord, bless my friend. Maybe everybody ought to reach out to a friend and say, Lord, bless my friend. God, in the name of Jesus, here I am. The evening shadows lengthen and I hear you saying, come home. Oh, I give you praise. Come home, come home, it's supper time, we're going home at last. Sister Crawford, can you sing that for us? come down and begin to pray with folks. I asked the preachers who are in the group, all the house leaders, I'm asking everybody that's in a leadership role, find somebody right now and pray with them. Let's pray together for Jesus is coming soon. We're going home at last. 